I'm Lisa Smedman. I'm the curator of Haven't Got a Clue, Papercut Arcade's remix game jam of the classic board game Clue. I'd like to welcome you all to our salon, celebrating the games that were created this time around. And here's a little bit of an introduction to what we've got on offer tonight. Hi, my name is John Dawes, and my submission to the Paper Cut Arcade's Clue Remix Jam is called Campus Life Undergrads on Ecstasy. My intent was to use all of the contents of the original Clue board game except the rules, which would be replaced by a single double-sided sheet that would fit in the game box. Because of pandemic restrictions on getting together in person, I also uploaded a PDF copy of the rules in a clone of the Clue board game on Steam's Tabletop Simulator. I really wanted to replace the murder aspect of Clue with love, so my game is all about a bunch of college students who go to a party in a big mansion owned by Mr. Body, who is not present. The undergrads are there to get high and maybe hook up with someone, but the scoring system is based on how good a match was made under these conditions. Unlike the original Clue, there is not necessarily a single winner. Players can tie, and players who didn't win can still compare their scores against the others for placement. Once only two unattached players are left, Mr. Body comes home, and the remaining players can either get together with each other, hook up with Mr. Body, or just leave the party, any of which outcomes end the game. I'm not going to talk about the game mechanics of hooking up, but if you like the idea, please give my game a try and let me know what you think. Hello, my name is Christopher Allen Slater, and my Clue Remix is, put simply, a mashup of a version of the rules of the game Assassin with the components and board of the game of Clue. Instead of trying to find out who the murderer is, in this game, Assassin Clue, aka Clue Assassin, everyone is an assassin trying to murder their targets, other assassins in the game. Mr. Body's Mansion is where this deadly game plays out and each assassin at the outset has familiarity with one of the rooms, and a specialty with one of the weapons found in the house. They can use these to their advantage both in taking out their target, but also in fending off their own would-be assassin. When a player succeeds in eliminating their target, they are rewarded with the target's weapons and rooms, as well as their target. The game proceeds until there is only one assassin left standing in Mr. Body's mansion, and they are declared the winner. I'm Lisa Smitman. I'm the designer of Clue, True Colors, a game based on the original Clue game. My inspiration for this game was this card from the original game from the 1960s, which I played as a kid, Miss Scarlet. She's one of the six characters in the original game, and I just thought she looked so creepy, so fake. Such a sweet smile. What does that hide? And I decided that every player in my game would be Miss Scarlet. So every player has the same pawn, a Miss Scarlet pawn. And part of the game, a big part of the game, is figuring out who each of these doppelgangers really is. What are their true colors? So you might actually be Mrs. Cyan or your true identity might actually be Mr. Green, or your true identity might actually be Mr. Pink. So I've included the six characters from the original game, as well as some other characters that I created that were based on the characters listed in the patent for Cluedo, or Clue as it was eventually called. Um, the patent for the game included a host of other color names for characters that never made the cut for the final game. So in, in this game you've got a, a secret identity which must be revealed and a vulnerability to um, particular places and particular weapons which allows you to be killed. 
So having come up with that idea, I next took a look at the board and I wanted 12 rooms, 12 characters, 12 weapons. So I added in um, some weapons that once again were listed in the patent, but that didn't make the cut for um, the clue game that eventually got published. And I took the board, expanded it a little bit, broadened it out, added a few extra rooms. And then because I was really inspired by colors, the idea, the whole notion of colors in the game, I grayscaled the entire board and really liked the look of this. I added to the board this big central space that has a color wheel in it and then these additional color wheels that serve as teleportation spaces for you to move other players around and uh, teleport across the game board to get to where you're going quickly. So I had a lot of fun with this. Um, I've put it through several iterations. I'm not sure how well it will play. I'm looking forward to finding that out during the salon, but I'm quite happy with the visuals and I'm hoping that uh, this little game of cat and mouse of revealing tr another player's true colors so that you can kill them will be a fun game for everyone to play. Hi, I'm going to narrate a demonstration of my solitaire version of Clue. For the purposes of the demonstration, I'm using a custom board with custom pieces. It's a BTS board, but the hallways are the same as uh, your standard Clue game, so it will work on your standard Clue board as well. Um, because it's a BTS custom board, I have got an extra suspect, an extra object, um, so I'm just removing them for the demonstration. Now I'm going to pick my uh, answer from the three decks. Now it's important here that I actually forgot to um, remove the extra object from the object deck. So you'll see me correct that later and there'll be a small blip in the video um, where I take it out and then reshuffle the cards. So before I deal out the cards, I'm going to make my guesses. Um, because my custom cards, you can tell who the suspects are. I have to make my guesses before I deal them out. But basically, this is me putting my bets in of what the answer is. So I've got markers for each character, as you would in the original Clue game. I'm putting them in different locations and with different objects. Um, in order to try to guess at what the answer might be. Okay, and that was the small blip. It just was me um, <laughs> taking out the object card and then repulling the middle uh, ca uh, cards. So those are repulled because I had to look at the deck, obviously. And then I reshuffled, and now I'm going to deal out the cards, and it's two per each room. So now we're going to figure out the starting position of the timer. So I've, I've numbered the entry points um, from one to six clockwise from the top of the board. And I just rolled a six. So the timer starts on the six entry point, and then it will travel the length of the board to the opposite entry point, which is at this time three. Now you also have the option of rolling for the exit point. So for instance, you could roll a five and then it travels a shorter distance or a two and it travels a shorter distance. I've just decided to do it um, the longest game possible, which is uh, going to the three. And then I rolled from my entry point and it's the first entry. The markers I'm using are just from a story board because I just needed two markers that were unique. Um, and sorry is the only board game I own. So the way it works is you roll normally and anytime you're in a hallway, after your goal, if you're not in a room, then the timer rolls and then the timer moves.
Once you're in a room, you can flip over a card to get a clue. At this point, I got the dancing shoes, which I'd put placed in the room already. So even though that's not the answer, you do have the option of tracking points, where is if you guess an object in the correct room or a person in the correct room, you can get five points. I've put it as five points. It's arbitrary, of course, but it's just a way is to track how well you did in your bets, um, sort of in a second way uh, at the start. And it's kind of fun if you lose the game to just to see how how many points you racked up during the game, even if you lost it. So much like the um, clue game, you can have shortcuts between the corners. So I realized this is a good chance to stay in rooms so that the timer doesn't move. So I've gone to the other corner and flipped over a card. You can only flip over one card when you enter a room. So I got Hope World, which is the room just above. So I just put the card next to the room so it's easy to spot which rooms have been uncovered. And then it's movement as usual. I'm in a hallway, so the timer gets to go. And this is the artist lounge, which is the one across the way. Again, I just marked the rooms by moving the card over there. Because I know the artist lounge isn't in play, I can then change my bet for the answer. Again, the timer moves if I'm in a hallway. It's the Olympic Stadium, which is in the corner, so I know that that's out of play. But the only thing in there are the dancing shoes, which are also out of play. And the vocal room in the top corner is also out of play now, so I can move that original bet to someplace else. I got the Genius Lab. Now, technically, you could get a point for that if um, you wanted to track points. If a card is dealt into the room that it is in, I like to give myself one point because that's fun. Um, because I got Genius Lab, I'm now changing the bet that I had in there. The timer hasn't moved recently because I've been in rooms, but it's about to move now. And move again, so I can tell that my game is going to quickly come to an end, so I've got to strategize at this point because I've only got a few moves left. So going to the corner room again, so I got the tennis racket. So I know that the tennis racket is now not going to be one of my answers. So I can just move it off the board. And again, since I've got so little time, I'm going to use the shortcut to stay inside room so the timer doesn't move. And then I can eliminate at least one suspect. So for the purposes of this game, I can just move, I can occupy the same square as the timer. Um, and you don't have to go around it. And say, similarly, the timer can walk right through the square that I'm in when it's moving. Again, just eliminate another suspect. And 
and stay inside room at the end of my turn as much as possible so the timer doesn't complete its journey. And I got the dorm, which means that I can move those bets because I know that nothing occurs in that room. And again, stay in rooms by taking this shortcut because I really only got one timer turn left and I get the practice room, which is the lower right room, which means I can then move those bets. And I'll try to make it to the next room, but the timer completes its journey, so game's over. So now I get to read the answer. And see if any of my guesses were correct. And they were. So I've got V with the paints in the gym. And I've won the game. Looking for a Clue as to Why by Kay Slater For this year's work, Kay continues their exploration using video, which they began last year in the 2020 Game Remix exhibition, Scrabblegram. In Looking for a Clue as to Why, they examine the possibilities of using ready-mades and recognizable game materials as narrative tools. Exploring themes related to social anxiety, especially in the face of mounting pressure to return to normal after 16 months of the global COVID-19 pandemic, Kay uses the Clue board game as a venue for a fictional social gathering where the game pieces and their associated Clue characters become obstacles and antagonists to the viewer slash player. The viewer attends an art opening hosted at a non-conventional heritage site a mansion as impressive as the works on display. While they wish to attend and participate in the public event to experience the artwork and to support the artist, the cost is socialization, and they must move through the interactions with a set of familiar characters who regularly attend these events, but who apparently have incongruous goals. Using ReadyMades I borrowed a copy of the 1996 North American version of the game Clue from a friend, while I didn't limit myself to only using pieces found in the box, I did have a goal of using all the available pieces in some way. I enjoy the practice of using ready maids to tell a story and have fond memories of miniature doll sets and creating scenes with my toys growing up. I'd spend more time creating the worlds and homes where my dolls would live in and work at than actually playing in them. It's definitely a playtime skill that has directly translated and continues to influence my art exploration and career as an adult. Even now, when I play board games, I tend to be more interested in the game pieces and the board as a miniature world, often disappointed when they are merely vehicles for complicated and wordy rules. I suffer profound anxiety when learning new games with people when I haven't had the chance to familiarize myself with the contents of a game, the name of the game pieces, and a chance to read through the rules prior to playing. My anxiety comes from being unable to hear clearly and being slower at processing oral information, especially when folks are excitedly talking over each other and sharing strategy. But solo time with the game board is a low stakes opportunity to imagine explore, and play, which is where I find joy and possibility. I struggle to find a balance between showing and telling the story. In my mind, having felt anxiety at social events and as an arts worker, my narrative is very clear. The weapon tokens were figurative objects that could be placed, and the rooms were already set up on the board. Once the character cards were scanned, I translated the character portraits in a format similar to the adventure games I had grown up playing, and still enjoy to this day, 
but this forced more text than I had originally planned when I created my storyboards and shot my scenes. I never intended to have any sound in the video, but with so much text, I decided to add a voiceover for accessibility. A lot of the text is obscured on purpose, but it's important to me to prioritize access equally with mood. So I added the voiceover so that I could keep the visuals that induced stress and required labor without creating extra barriers for low vision or non-visual viewers. I encourage those who can see the video to try watching it with the sound off. Mix White raises an eyebrow and gestures towards you. Mix Peacock nods slightly, but continues to speak with Mix White. Then what have you been up to since I saw you last month, Mix White? Oh, I've been traveling, and only recently returned from- You are not required any longer. You take the opportunity to step away. Accessible Spaces I work professionally as an arts worker and preparator in multiple gallery spaces across Coast Salish territory. In addition to my own personal art practice, I use the opportunity to work in these spaces to question traditional and colonial display and exhibition standards, especially through an accessibility and ability-focused lens. Much of the work that goes into planning and preparing exhibition spaces is hidden, and in most institutions and formal gallery spaces, display and installation structure is designed to be hidden so that the focus is on the artwork. You're more likely to pay attention to the fact that a famous painting is crooked than the contents of the painting itself if you were to visit a formal museum or gallery. It is this practice of discussing and contemplating the unseen that drives a lot of my inquiry around display. It goes deeper than whether or not a light is correctly positioned or if the hanging hardware on a work is hidden or flushed to the wall. The environment in which a show is exhibited is easy to overlook or simply to take for granted especially in formal spaces that use the aesthetic of the white box to house artwork simply and invisibly. However, this assumption is interrupted as soon as you start to consider the actual audience who needs to move through and populates a space. A visually spectacular and professionally installed show does not necessarily mean it is accessible. And with many high art conceptual traveling exhibitions, Accessibility is up to the institution and gallery to consider and execute. This long-winded walk through the frustrations and considerations of hosting a show is basically to bring you where I was when I looked at the board as a potential gallery. My first instinct was to cover the staircase in the center of the board, but I decided that I would bring in some stanchions to visually indicate that the staircase was inaccessible. Once the stairs were out of the way, the second most common hurdle for public spaces is accessible washrooms. While it makes sense that a board game mansion designed for little plastic effigies would have no need of toilets, the same argument could be made that limbless concave cones don't need libraries and ballrooms, nor do the stomachless creatures need a kitchen. Additionally, there's a set of social structures and rules around going to and occupying public washrooms, and so this was another essential addition to my story and set. There is shame and vulnerability in using a public washroom. There is disgust at how others use washrooms. There is punishment and politics around which communities and neighborhoods deserve to have access to public washrooms. And frustratingly, there are unnecessary arguments and judgments around who can use which room to go about their bodily needs. It was important that it be added to my gallery space, and I've kept the little painting I did to bring out for future playthroughs of the game. If only essential facility upgrades were as easy as whipping out a paintbrush. Anxiety and Cognitive Therapy at the risk of sounding like an after-school special, it was important to me that the narrative concluded by recounting the events from the evening and examining each from a different perspective than was originally presented. Since this work deals with mental illness and anxiety, I wanted to bring in an aspect of cognitive behavioral therapy where one is encouraged to review events and the thoughts associated with an event to consider not only the negative, but also the positive and neutral. While there isn't necessarily a satisfying conclusion to my story, 
The act of reviewing an event without rumination and self-hate, open to the possibility that interactions with others can be positive or neutral, is one that I hope to keep practicing, especially after distancing for 16 months and with the inevitable and looming return of in-person public events. Relearning to socialize using healthy coping mechanisms is the goal. True Neutral I struggled to photograph both the game board and the cards due to their texture and finish. As copyrighted material, it being difficult to repurpose, scan, or reuse any of these assets wasn't surprising, but it was certainly frustrating. Eventually I was able to diffuse the lighting for filming enough so that I didn't have a hot spot on my game board, but the cards never scanned or photographed clearly. I ended up isolating the character portraits and discarded the text and remaining card area, which ultimately worked as it gave me the opportunity to play with their names and honorifics. However, even without the text, I felt it was still too easy to gender and make generalizations about the characters based on their hairstyles and clothing. The only character who wears glasses is called Professor. The woman with the come-hither gaze? Unmarried. The stuffy figure with a bushy beard? A colonel. I appreciate that the original art from the 1949 game was likely created after the characters were named, and it's a board game. From the 50s. Asking for dimension and representation is asking a lot, especially from a game that originated in the UK and was popularized after the Second World War. And yet I do. I do ask for more. I considered redrawing the characters, but also I didn't want to create a revisionist version of Clue where Miss White became a piercing enthusiast and Professor Plum was a physical education teacher. I didn't want to change the races or ancestry of any of the characters without research and consideration. I also didn't really mind that the characters looked the way they did. They certainly look like people who one would find at a high-profile art function. What I wanted to change was how we judged the characters by how they looked, and how the names played into these perceptions. I wanted to imagine a world where appearance didn't factor into gender, and in fact sex and gender were irrelevant to socialization. I wanted the bearded colonel to be named Miss Scarlet, rocking a beard without it being notable, unless it's a very excellent and noteworthy beard. I wanted Mistress White to be the name of a maid-themed sex worker coming to the event before her shift started, and for her age and specific profession to be a non-factor. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized that the thing that I wanted to do away with wasn't the family names, but rather the honorifics. And so I did. Within my own dollhouse, there is only one gender. My sandbox, my toys, my rules. Thanks for joining us. Hope you enjoyed the games.